Autonomous cars aren't here yet, but the technology enabling their reality is quickly advancing. Just look at Chattanooga, Tennessee, home to the largest smart intersection project in the United States. Here, the city is rolling out cameras and LIDAR in over 80 intersections, tracking the behaviors of cars and pedestrians. Between the intersections was a long uh, distance, so there was a lot of crossing the street on the undesignated area. So we, one of the things was we wanted to understand where are the pedestrians crossing the street. And the other thing that the mayor's office wanted us to look into was near misses. One of the top challenges facing autonomous cars is the unpredictable nature of our roads, which is why critics say a human touch is critical for self-driving cars to see. Could that touch come in the form of this? Sensors and edge devices, perception software, all technology that you expect to see inside an autonomous car. LiDAR offers a depth of field that's very unique now increasingly found on the outside. I believe that the infrastructure being intelligent is the key missing step. But here's the thing. And there's a lot of infrastructure that's struggling, uh, that's aged, that's got technology that's 20, 30 years old. But now we're coming back because we came together and passed the bipartisan infrastructure law. The infrastructure law passed under President Biden is dishing out billions for states to modernize their infrastructure. This, as automakers say, self-driving cars could hit the market in the next decade. Will cities be ready to adopt them? Let's find out. It's time to get connected to one of the nation's smartest cities, Chattanooga, Tennessee. When you think of a tech hub, you probably think of Silicon Valley. But have you been to the Silicon Valley of the South? Less than 200,000 people call Chattanooga, Tennessee home, yet the city has become a tech test bed thanks to its utility-owned fiber network, which began serving customers in 2010. What we have is basically a 100% uh, fiber to the premise network. It serves every home and business in a 600 square mile area, about 9,000 miles of fiber optics, and the population it serves is just under half a million people. Uh, we use it to deliver connectivity services, uh, including internet, uh, up to 25 megabits per second. We have the fastest community-wide internet uh, service available in the United States. And we also use the fiber optic network as the communications backbone for one of the most advanced smart uh, power grid systems in the United States. So we manage our electric system using the fiber optic network as well. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the, you know, return on investment here that you've seen. Let's talk about the, you know, the economic value uh, and also just the idea that you're attracting more businesses to settle in Chattanooga as well. Certainly. We actually commissioned a projection uh, of the community benefit as we were, you know, doing our business planning before we rolled anything out. And then uh, at the 10-year mark after, and actually at the five and the 10-year mark after the deployment, we went back and said, okay, well, you know, this is what we projected. How did it actually turn out? And what we found at the 10 year mark uh, was that uh, the internet, uh, the fiber optic system and smart grid had generated about $2.7 billion in community value. And it consists of everything from, I mentioned that uh, the smart grid allows us to reroute power around, uh, you know, damage to the system. Uh, that's led to a 55% reduction in outage durations and, and minutes. Now, interestingly, the network almost didn't happen. It faced lawsuits and outcries from critics who claimed that the network would eat away the telecom market, an argument that's quite common across the country. In fact, 16 cities are currently banned from building their own networks. What kind of impact has that had upon innovation? A question that comes to mind as we dig into the smart city projects that have come alive inside the city of Chattanooga, home to a smart intersection project that's grown massively in recent years, from a mile and a half radius to now about a hundred intersections. The, the fact that we had the fiber, it made it easier for us, more efficient and potentially more cost effective to deploy that. 
Dr. Mina Sartipi is the founding director of the Center for Urban Informatics and Progress at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, which initially funded the Smart Corridor project with support from the city and partners. It later got federal funding to expand the project. Today, you'll find LIDAR, cameras, audio, and air quality sensors deployed at the intersections. So before the Smart Intersection was expanded, what outcomes did you see from your, oh, what was like a mile and a half or so where you initially tested? So there was about uh, almost nine months between the time that the, we got the approval from the university, from the city, from EPP to deploy this till the first pull was like, you know, all the equipment were installed in our first intersection. That time was spent on community engagement. We did a lot of surveys, a lot of focus groups. And one of the things that came up very high was pedestrian safety. So we, one of the things was we wanted to understand where are the pedestrian crossing the street. And um, there were areas that we understood that the, between the intersections was long uh, distance. So there was a lot of uh, crossing the street on the undesignated areas, which obviously it would be risky. And the other thing that we realized and um, uh, the mayor's office wanted us to look into was near misses or near hit, depending how you want to say it. That it would be like, okay, so if an accident had happened, there is a record of it, but what are the areas that they, they, maybe there hasn't been an accident, but there's a lot of near misses happening. So that was one of the things that we looked into very early on in different intersections in terms of the traffic control timing and in terms of where the crosswalks uh, will be and such. So some of those has been implemented. And the other thing that currently we are working on is a funded project with the Department of Energy that we are uh, op optimizing the traffic controllers along the corridor. And this is a this is basically making it adaptive. And so when, just to confirm, when you say adaptive, you mean real time, like uh, analyzing yeah, that data in real time? Yes. The, the final, final goal is to be able to look at the data and based on the data, based on the current occupancy, predict the future occupancy in the next cycle occupancy, and based on that, adapt the traffic controller. So a lot of those would be based on data that will be collected in real time, and the decision will be made, and the, uh, the traffic controller will be adjusted. The project is interesting for many reasons, particularly its use of LiDAR. A sensing technology that uses light in the form of a pulsed laser to measure ranges. LiDAR, um you know, kind of got a bad rap because it was so expensive. It, that seemed to be right. one of the, the main hurdles to get over. Is that still an issue when you think about expanding, further expanding this or, or deploying more LIDAR in your city? You know, that's a great question because when we deployed our test bed, we didn't even think about LIDAR because it was so expensive. The price has came down quite a bit since like, you know, it, like um, the three, four years ago that when we were starting to um, the um, purchasing process and everything, the, pr the price has came down. And um, as of now, still is our plan to have uh, all 100 intersections have LIDARs and cameras. And we would we are hoping, and we have great partners in the LIDAR, both in the, from the hardware, and which we work with Auster, and from the software part, we work with Soul Robotics. Those are our uh, industry partners that we work with them that we are, we are gonna continue working with them and making sure that you know we have, we will be able to deploy it and, and, and as it gets expanded. But the need for technologies like LiDAR is there really for improving the accuracy. Typically, we associate it with the tech found inside an autonomous car, where it helps the car to see its surroundings, but not everyone's convinced of its value there. It's expensive and unnecessary, and as Andre was saying, once you solve vision, it, it's been worthless. Musk has led Tesla's crusade against the technology. He says cameras and computer vision are just as effective as LiDAR and come at a lower cost. He's not wrong. LiDAR is expensive, but that's changing. Let's check in with the 6.5 co-host and the Future Room Group CEO, Daniel Newman. Uh, LiDAR offers a depth of field that's very unique. It and by the way, I've actually experienced this. I rode in the back of a Tesla, um, and then I rode in the back of a Lexus that was powered by Luminar's LiDAR at a CES, and there were some different experiments. And for instance, they did, you know, the kind of static stop, which the traditional sensing with cameras worked really well. But then they did something like where a child comes out from behind a a vehicle that was parked along the side of a busy road and LIDAR 
was able to stop very promptly, uh, whereas traditional camera radar technology missed it altogether mm-hmm. and ran over the child. In fact, one of the most shared ever social videos I saw was that exact demonstration. Wow. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I remember when I first started covering LiDAR, this was like 2019, 2020. Uh, and Elon Musk at the time, like famously was like, oh, well, our cars aren't going to use uh, LIDAR. And it's a big debate of whether it was needed or not. And now it seems, at least in the smart city space, is the idea of using cameras and LIDAR together to, you know, have the, the best vision zero path forward for pedestrian safety and stuff like that. It's an interesting debate that the industry is having because we've seen with Tesla, for instance, how a company can largely use vision only on camera to create a safe and secure uh, near autonomous driving experience, except in those cases where it didn't work. And there have been some of them. And when you can add LiDAR, and of course, price has always been a problem. You know, it was multi thousands of dollars per vehicle, but of course, we've seen that come down. And then anyone that's seen some of the LiDAR driving around on Waymo and some of the the driverless vehicles saw the uh, size and the profile of LiDAR and having a large computer in your trunk and then having a large sensor on your roof. And it was pretty instantaneously recognized that that's not a um, realistic modality for having a vehicle, but we've seen the profile now. If you look at like what Luminar did with its XC90 and Volvo, it's a very low profile sits right above the mirror in front of, uh, of, of the windshield and offers the same LiDAR capabilities. And I've had a number of conversations with Luminar CEO, Austin Russell, and you know he'll actually talk about the fact that it's now under $1,000 a vehicle. And of course, in very economical vehicles, that could be a challenge, but you also have to think about what is the value of a life? Now, just to play devil's advocate here, let's take another look at that smart intersection project in Chattanooga. Chattanooga is currently collecting massive amounts of data about its road conditions, data that new technologies like V2X and V2V will be able to communicate to cars on the road. I would think that takes a lot of pressure off of the cars, which maybe don't need to be as smart as we thought. So LiDAR is just one piece of the puzzle. So absolutely the more technology and the more connected things you have in a space, the better your success potential is going to be on anything you deploy. Earlier I spoke with William Mueller of Soul Robotics, the company behind the perception software within the LiDAR sensors. Check it out. So so what we do is, is us, our software sits on the edge at the, in the cabinet. We have our own processor. And what we find that most cities, in, including Chattanooga, do is they, they take the, the actionable events from us and use that to put function from the camera system. You know, somebody crossing a, p- a pedestrian crossing or somebody jaywalking, then we can take an actionable event and say, okay, let's bring up the video feed. Let's try and understand what's going on there to say, well, you know, maybe it's, you know, it might be uh, a mother on a stroller, you know, take a little longer to cross the road or it might be somebody with handicapped, something like that. You know, those are kind of some example use cases. Um, as well as the technology has very uh, deep insights where you actually know the size, the speed, the heading, the trajectory of those objects. And then all the data, the process data, the, the data that's got the events and, and that's relevant that the city needs is all then pushed over the fiber network to their, uh, call it their data center. Um, and at their data centers where they do a lot of the uh, fusion of data and information, overlaying of information. But actually in parallel, because they have the bandwidth available, they also do real-time uh, data fusion and overlay of information. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, but just just to confirm, and you probably said this and it's going over my head, but the your software only then dictates the LiDAR sensors or it takes all the footage from also the cameras and then pieces them together. No, only from the LiDARs. Okay. Um, we only take the LiDAR data and then push the information to the camera systems. So I... basically, so, so the camera system still does its own thing. We do its own, our own thing. There is actually just kind of, so we're kind of in the middle right now. We're stuck in the middle. We've got two systems. 
Now, there is some programs that are starting to take place where now this is becoming like a sensor fusion approach. But you do sit with a risk there again, right? When you suddenly start bringing in the image onto the 3D data and combining the two again, well, then you say, well, wait a minute, now we're compromising the aspect of privacy. So in some instances, you kind of still need to keep them apart. But from a data processing in the background, uh, there is some levels of sensor fusion going on when you might be doing things like speed enforcement or you might be doing things like uh, 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 flow uh, tolling systems where vehicles are passing through and you need something to trigger where to take the plate cover and things like that. So those are some use cases where you're seeing a, more of a data fusion versus a image fusion. I see. I think Bella Dean, CEO, talked about how the smart city market is just going to be a top driver for LiDAR. Do you agree with that statement? Um, and if so, like, how does then the smart city vertical kind of further push the adoption of LiDAR into other areas like automotive? So, so this is a topic that uh, I'm pretty passionate about. Uh, you know, our Soul Robotics is a company. We ultimately originally developed that software to think it's going to go on autonomous vehicles, right? That was our goal when we first started developing this technology. But you quickly realize a couple of things, right? The time of where things are and the time it takes to get to where you want to be. And to be able to decide between two, two paths, right? So there's one path where you've got city to city connection, where you've got these long haul highways or interstates running from one state to the other. It's a lot easier to run autonomous solutions on long hauls because you don't have a lot of dynamics, right? It's pretty much just a highway pretty much the same structure, the way things work was, was all kind of standardized to some degree. Now I try and do it in a city. It's very dynamic. You add people, you add bikes, you add a lot of buildings, you add a lot of obstructions, occlusions. It starts making autonomy very, autonomy solutions very challenging. We see a lot of videos out there out of these vehicles getting stuck at certain scenarios not knowing what to do. So we took a decision a while back and said, wait a minute, we believe that the step before autonomous should be smart infrastructure. So having the infrastructure, having a level of intelligence is actually going to make the path to autonomy more successful. So now to make that happen and to catch up, because I almost feel like the development of the vehicles are almost a little bit ahead of the infrastructure. And as we all know, a lot of aging infrastructures out there, right? a lot of you know, take North America specifically. I mean, there's a lot of infrastructure that's struggling, right? That's aged, that's got technology that's 20, 30 years old that I don't think they even make parts for the stuff anymore. But somehow, you know, we want to start seeing these autonomous vehicles cruising the streets there. We want to start seeing these last mile delivery robots running through there. All of that stuff is going to be a lot more successful when that infrastructure is in place to support that. It's interesting to look at how Chattanooga has overcome those challenges. As we mentioned earlier, the University of Tennessee Chattanooga has played a massive role in the deployment of smart city projects in Chattanooga. The majority of these works, if not like 100% of them, are done by our students. So this is also an opportunity for, the, for them, to, for the students to get experience with the real world scenario, to work with people outside of the university. The same thing for, I think, from the company's perspective would be you know, that they, um, some brilliant young minds would get to work on some of their challenges and their, their alongside with them. In this episode, we also discussed the value of the utility-owned fiber network, which has enabled the city to test new technologies in a cost-effective way. Many areas in the country are unable to do that as evidenced by the digital divide. That combined with our aging infrastructure contains a challenge the arrival of an autonomous future. The Biden administration's infrastructure law could help as it dishes out billions to cities to invest in broadband, close the digital divide, and modernize our infrastructure. Could that be the missing piece to the puzzle? Well, stay tuned because I'll be sure to connect you with what happens next. Till next time, I'm Diana Blass.